Exodus in chapter 7, and a lot in chapter 8. Um, yeah, uh, chapter 8, we use it a lot. Um, Five, we're going to start off with a very simple introduction of aqueous solutions themselves. And again, it all starts with water. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we talked about bonding way back in chapter 3. And we said that there were two types of bonding. That we have covalent, where we share electrons between two atoms. And we have ionic. In ionic, instead of sharing, one atom will give up one or more electrons to another. So if you think about the bonding here, here we have perfect sharing, and here we have none. Well, in fact, if the two atoms that are involved in a covalent bond are not identical, then the sharing is much less than perfect. Let's talk a little bit about making the covalent bond itself. We all recognize this as the Lewis structure for chlorine. Chlorine has group 7, 7 valence electrons, whatever. In order to make chlorine the element that we see every day, Cl2, what we do is bring another chlorine atom in so that we can pair up these electrons in between share them, and when we do that, each atom has a complete octet of electrons. Now, uh, quite often we will replace these shared electrons with a dash, because that just makes it so much easier to write structures. Alright, like I said, when you have a covalent bond and the atoms are identical, the sharing is perfect. Okay. Let's look at two examples. This is molecular hydrogen, H2, and this is hydrogen fluoride, HF. <clears throat> what we're going to do is use what's known as an electrostatic potential map to describe the electron distribution around the atoms and within the covalent bond. The electrostatic potential map is going to be generally colored, and the colors are going to indicate where we have excess electron density and where we have electron deficient centers. So let's start with hydrogen. With hydrogen, um, what we do is we, the computer, calculates the region around the atoms. It does the electron density and then it will go to every point and um, assess how many electrons are available at that spot. Then it colors it. So this is just a nice little green Easter egg. Um, and what this tells us is that the distribution between the two hydrogens is essentially identical. With hydrogen fluoride, however, we get something that looks like a very interesting Easter egg. Uh, this end of the electrostatic potential map is somewhat blunted. This one's expanding. And this is very blue. Blue is used to indicate the deficiency or lack of electron density. Red is used to indicate excess electron density. So the bottom line here is that the fluorine, which is here, seems to be pulling the electrons out of this covalent bond towards itself. So it's not sharing very well. Pulling the electrons this way towards itself. The reason for this is something called electronegativity. Um, electronegativity is an arbitrary scale. It starts at supposed to start at zero, but the lowest one is about 0 0.7, and it will go up in a ramp from this corner of the periodic table all the way up here to fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative, 
And these little numbers here are all relative to each other. So uh, beryllium with 1.57 is much less than fluorine with 4. Um, again, it's the ability of an atom to attract electrons towards itself. For HF, hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1, fluorine is 4.0, and because of that, we suck the electrons down towards the fluorine, and we wind up with this shape. We show this using what we call a dipole. Dipole is just an arrow, and we put a cross on one end. The cross indicates the a region in the molecule that is positive, and the tip of the arrow is the negative end. So the lesson here is that covalent bonds between atoms that are different, we have imperfect sharing. The electrons are going to be attracted towards the most electronegative atom. Now, let's go to our friend water. We've done this many times, but go ahead and draw a Lewis structure for water. Oxygen is in group 6. Hydrogen, of course, is in group 1. Now, because oxygen is in group 6, it will have six valence electrons. And it'll look like that. We have to make two bonds to the hydrogens, so we're going to use these unpaired electrons here. Each hydrogen has one electron, so we'll bring them in. And this is our Lewis structure. If we convert the bonds here to dashes, it would kind of look like this. Now, if you look at the geometry here, um, I've drawn these things at wide angles. You could draw them straight, but Lewis structure wouldn't matter at all. But in reality, water has a geometry that looks a lot like this. Um, you'll cover this in general chemistry. But in general chemistry, you learn that because we have four different things around this oxygen, that is, two unshared pairs and two hydrogens, that this defines the geometry, the electron pair geometry, as centrohedral, and we call this geometry bent. The fact that water is bent is very, very important as far as water goes. Water is the most amazing solvent, most amazing substance ever. It just really is. Let's think about this in terms of electronegativity now. We have hydrogens and oxygens. They're different. If you look at that table that we looked at earlier, we'll see that the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1 and oxygen is 3.5. Now, just like an HF, that means that each of these covalent bonds is going to be polar. And we can draw two little dipoles for each of those bonds. But because water is bent, it's always bent, it always looks just like this. What this means is that there's going to be a molecular dipole. That this end of the molecule down by the hydrogens is going to be positive. And this end by the um, oxygen is going to be negative. The molecular dipole would look something like this. Positive end down here in between the two oxygens, and the negative end up here by the oxygen. If we do an electrostatic potential map, we see that that's confirmed. It looks like this. We see we have a big blue bottom here for our two hydrogens. 
and a real bright red oxygen up here. Our molecular dipole, as you can clearly see it now, goes from positive here to negative at the top. That's our molecular dipole. Now, the fact that water has a molecular dipole, and that's bent, allows it to do um, fairly remarkable things. One of the things that it can do is dissolve ionic compounds. We call these solutions, right? We remember from back in chapter two that these are heterogeneous mixtures where we, uh, homogeneous mixtures, I'm sorry, where we distribute the ions from the ionic compound evenly throughout the water. Let's look at that process. This is a cute little movie. This represents um, a crystal of sodium chloride. The sodiums are shown as the little silver balls, and the chlorines are the green balls. Um, when you put this in something like water, it dissolves. So let's go ahead and watch the process of this dissolution. Water comes in, you're going to grab the ions from the crystal face and move them out into solution. And slowly they work their way through the whole crystal and it basically goes. But I hope that as you were watching this little movie, you noticed that the process was not random. In fact, The chlorides, the chlorine anions, were always surrounded by three or four waters, but the waters were always oriented so that the negative, I'm sorry, the positive side of the water molecule, the water dipole, is facing the negative charge. Over here, this is a positive center. If you watch carefully, waters were always oriented like this so that they were the negative oxygen was always pointing towards the positive charge. This is the feature that allows water to dissolve an ionic substance because it can take each of the ions and stabilize them in solution by surrounding them with either a positive or a negative field. What this does is it disperses the charge. Nature really doesn't like charged things, really doesn't. Water, however, is very, very good at taking a charge and spreading it out. Let's look at that. This again is gonna be an exercise in electrostatic potential mass. And this is a sodium ion. Now remember we said blue represents positive, red was negative. So here I've taken our sodium ion and I've only placed three waters around it. Again, the oxygens are all pointing in. These are the negative end of the dipole towards our positive center. What I do is I tell the computer to go ahead and calculate what the electrostatic potential map for the whole complex is here, for all four, the sodium and the three waters. When we do this, we get something like this. You should note that not only is this big sodium that's in the middle, and here's what it looks like, remember it's here, here's our waters, not only is it gone, but we've actually got a little yellow splotch there where it used to be. The water has very effectively taken the positive charge and has moved it out to the periphery of the complex. Now in chapter eight, we're gonna see an example where we do the same calculation with seven waters around it. And that will basically totally eliminate any hint of the charge. 
The water is just absolutely amazing at this because it can distribute the charge, and that's why things dissolve in water. Now we're going to be talking about solutions. Solutions implies solubility. So let's make sure we understand the words that we use here. <clears throat> if something dissolves, we say it's soluble. The solubility, the term solubility, is the maximum amount of a substance that you can dissolve under a given set of conditions. So, magnesium carbonate is not very soluble in water, but in one liter of water, one atmosphere, 25 degrees centigrade, about half a gram will dissolve. Therefore, we talk about the solubility of magnesium carbonate, we say it's simply 0.53 grams per liter. That's what solubility is. When we have magnesium carbonate and we have 0.53 grams per liter dissolved, we can't get any more unless you play tricks. We call that a saturated solution. Saturated simply means under normal conditions, you cannot get any more in. Okay? Again, two words, solvent is the thing that does the dissolving, that's water here, and solute, the thing that's being dissolved, in our example, that was magnesium carbonate. Now, the neatest thing about all of this is a, uh, not just a saturated solution, but there are solutions where you can coax in more than you're supposed to. And we refer to those as Supersaturated. Supersaturated solution has more stuff in it than it's supposed to. You have to make these very, very, very carefully. And they're very fragile, very unstable. What we're going to do in this little video, this is sodium acetate dissolved in water. And it's way oversaturated. It's supersaturated. But as long as you're really careful with it, it'll just sit there. What we're going to do is take one teeny tiny crystal, one crystal of sodium acetate, rub it down the neck of the flask here so it hits the surface. As soon as you disturb the surface with this one crystal, well, let's see what happens. This is in real time, too. There, just hit. And instantly, you see this mass of crystals start to grow. And eventually, this entire flask will essentially solidify from the sodium acetate. It also gets really hot. Um, this is one of the strategies for storing things like solar energy. You can use the heat from the sun to make a saturated solution. Keep it very carefully. And then at night when it's cold, you induce crystallization, and this stuff gets really hot again. So it's kind of neat. Super saturated. All right, a little more about solubility. There's a Rule of thumb for solubility. There are two types, generally there are two types of compounds in We'll call them polar and nonpolar. The example we saw for HF, that's very polar. It contains polar covalent bonds. Um, water itself contains polar covalent bonds. Those are polar compounds. Things that don't have dipole moments are nonpolar. Um, hydrocarbons are examples of simple things without molecular dipoles. All right, so here we have ethanol. 
Ethanol has an OH group, just like water does. And this is a very polar bond. Because of that, ethanol and water, alcohol, mix freely. <coughs> and any proportions, the term we use here is miscible. However, if we took our water and we added olive oil, olive oil is a hydrocarbon. It is very nonpolar. It will not dissolve in water. The rule is light dissolves light. Polar solvent will dissolve a polar substance. If we had a nonpolar solvent, we could dissolve the olive oil. Any questions? There's also another feature called electrolytes. In general, there are two basic types of solutions. We call a solution that forms ions an electrolyte. And that's because, as we saw with sodium chloride, the ions separate out. And one of the features of that is that solution will now conduct an electric, an electric current. If we have a solution that does not have ions in it, it will not conduct an electric current. And that is a non-electrolyte. The way that we test for it and these are the little uh, devices that they use here at Triton. So if you do this in lab next semester, um, you, you'll see it. This is just basically a battery, um, two little wires sticking out the bottom, a little bit of electronic here. Um, you take a solution of some sort, stick the wires in here. Um, if the solution conducts electricity, the little LEDs here will light up. If they both light up, bright red, bright green, that means that it's a strong electrolyte. If you had something dissolved that was a non-electrolyte, you stick it in there, the things don't light up, and again, that is a non-electrolyte. There's a spectrum in between. You can actually use a conductivity meter to characterize things more clearly. But this is a nice, simple demonstration. The thing that you want to remember about electrolytes and non-electrolytes, basically, if your substance forms ions, it will be an electrolyte. Again, if there are ions in solution, these conduct electricity bright lights. If we have something like glucose, this is glucose. Glucose is soluble in water because it has polar OH bonds. Each of those has a dipole. That will dissolve very nicely in water. But when it dissolves, it doesn't make ions. If it doesn't make ions, it does not conduct electricity. It is a non-electrolyte. Any questions about solutions, the terminology, or whatever? All right, let's go ahead and expand this to the concept of molarity. Molarity, we talked about moles in chapter four. In molarity, all you're doing is taking a known volume of something. You know the number of moles. Therefore, molarity is simply the number of moles divided by volume. M stands for molarity. Another way to look at it, this is a volumetric flask. They are marked off with a little line, this would be one liter. Now this is one mole in a liter, isn't it? 
one mole per liter. All right. Here's our volumetric flask again. Um, in molarity, once again, it's simple. All we're doing is talking about the number of moles of a substance we have dissolved in every liter of solution. Now, the abbreviation for this is M. We'll see there are variations of that, but uppercase M. Make sure you do uppercase, because when you hit general chemistry, you will realize that lowercase m stands for molality. That's a cruel joke to play on people, molarity and molality. But it exists. So make sure you keep this up as a capital M. Remember, molarity is nothing more than the moles of solute, that's the stuff you dissolve, divided by the volume in liters. That's all in the world it is. Now, experimentally, if we want to make a solution of known molarity, what we would do is take a volumetric flask like this, and again, it's got a little etching here, little line etched in. It's exactly one liter. So we start off by putting our solute into the empty flask. Then we're going to add water and going to fill it until it hits the one liter mark. So you know how much stuff you put in. You weighed it. You know how many moles it is. You know exactly the volume of the solution in liters, and therefore you know the molarity. So let's do a problem. And like I said, in this chapter, there's a ton of problems. And I put a ton in here because um, there are just so many things we can do with this concept. These are just examples. On the exams, of course, we're going to keep it simple, but there's examples of what you can do with all this. All right, and our first one here. We have sodium bromide. We have 3.25 grams of it. And we have 1,250 milliliters of solution. We want to figure out the molarity. Okay. In order to calculate the molarity, we need the number of moles, don't we? Mm -hmm. But we can do that because we know the mass and we know the molar mass of sodium bromide. Once we know the number of moles, we simply have to divide it by the number of liters. Remember, it must be liters. Well, we were given milliliters here, but we can divide that by a thousand in our head. And that will give us our volume in liters. All right. What is this? This is the mass of sodium bromide. This is the molar mass of sodium bromide. What is one of the things that we remember? Mass divided by molar mass is moles. Remember, that's one of the things you say at night before you go to bed. <laughs> mass divided by molar mass is moles. So what we have here is simply moles of sodium bromide. Now to get molarity, we have to take moles of sodium bromide and divide it by liters. So we'll take this and simply divide by 1.2. Five liters. Now, if you look at our equations here, we have grams of sodium bromide, top and bottom here. They're going to cancel. We have per mole in the denominator. Remember, if we have a per something in the denominator, it goes up top. 
and just becomes mold. So the units of this are going to be mole per liter. That's molarity. So we do our very simple math. 3.25 divided by 102 divided by 1.25. And we get 0.0253 moles per liter. Now again, the abbreviation for moles per liter is molarity, uppercase M. But you'll see this done lots of different ways in textbooks and tutorials and everything else. Sometimes people will take the M and make it a tower. Okay, just to show that, hey, this is special, this is molarity. Sometimes people will take and put a line underneath the M underscore to indicate its polarity. And sometimes people will use this funny little script thingy, that's a script uppercase M, again to indicate polarity. You'll see it all different ways in all different books. But remember, uppercase M, molarity. Do another one. <clears throat> 6.47 grams of sodium acetate. 1450 mils of solution. What's our molarity? Just like before, we're going to convert our mass to moles and divide it by liters. Go ahead and set it up. mass for sodium acetate, and we have a molar mass for sodium acetate. Mass divided by molar mass is the same as moles. We have 1,450 mils. This must be in liters, so we divide by 1,000. And we have 1.45 liters. Just like before, grams of sodium acetate will cancel. Per mole will come up top. And simply take 6.47, divide by 82, divide by 1.45. We have 0.0544 moles per liter. Our solution is 0.0544 more. One more real simple one just like it. Go ahead and take this one and do it without me talking. We have a mass of potassium hydrogen phosphate, and we have its molar mass. We need to convert this into moles. We're going to do that by taking our mass, dividing by our molar mass. Our grams of potassium hydrogen phosphate cancel. We're going to divide that by a number of liters, and we have 275 mils, so that's 0.275 liters. We do our simple math, 238 divided by 174 divided by 0.275, 
and we get, oh, almost 5 moles per liter, or 4.97 moles. Now these are fun problems to do, and therefore, there's a tutorial. This is everybody's favorite format for the tutorial, where you're simply given three things, and you have to type in the one that's missing. Okay? Um, here we're given moles, and we're given volume. Yeah? That's it? That's it? See how simple all this is? How simple this chemistry stuff is. Okay. <laughs> Molarity is simply defined as moles divided by liters. We have 0.976 moles. We have 2.15 liters. Our solution is 0.454 molar. And we're given molarity, and we're given moles. What's our volume? Well, remember the very simple equation. Molarity is moles divided by liters. So we're simply going to solve for liters, aren't we? When we solve for liters, it's going to be moles divided by molarity. So here we have our number of moles, here we have our molarity, moles per liter. As you know here, moles and moles cancel, and we're only left with per liter, which again comes up top. And this gives us 4.26 liters. One more, work this one and I'll hush. If our molarity is 0.125, and we have 2.92 liters of it, how many moles are there? Well, again, if molarity is moles divided by liters, then liters Molarity will give us moles. Molarity times liters gives us moles. We're going to meet this one again in a few minutes. And it's very, very useful, just like mass over molar mass. This is concentration times volume. Concentration times volume is moles. All right, so here's our concentration, here's our volume. Simply multiply them together. We have 0.365 moles. Any question? All right, here's another problem that kind of parallels something that you might really do in lab. <clears throat> Let's say that we were doing an experiment, doing a reaction. And in this reaction, we needed 0.01 moles of KCl. You know, whatever reaction you want. But you needed a certain number of moles. Well, sitting here on the shelf is a solution. Labeled 0.18 molar. What volume do you need to pull out of there so that you have 0.01 moles? Kind of a real life problem. Uh, 
in order to calculate the volume, just like we did in the previous problem, we're going to take moles and divide by moles per liter. And remember, molarity, moles divided by liters. Look at it again. Molarity is moles per liter. And that's simply a number of moles divided by a number of liters, right? Well, here, we're going to solve for liters. So liters is going to come up, <coughs> molarity goes down, and here I just plug in the numbers. We want 0.01 moles, and we know that there's 0.18 moles in every liter. When we look at this, the moles are going to cancel. Again, this is per liter in the denominator, so it's going to come up top as liters. Do our simple calculation. And this is 0.056 liters. Now, in the lab, you would use milliliters, wouldn't you? So multiply this by 1,000. And we're up to 56 milliliters. Yep. So what you would do is you would just go grab your stock solution here, pull out 56 mils, and by gosh, that's 0.01 moles. That works, doesn't it? Let's do another one. Here I have sucrose, that's sugar. C12 is 22 over 11. And I have a two molar solution. Okay? Two moles of sucrose in every liter. If I take out 300 mils of it, how many sucrose molecules do I have? Now we can do this because we know how many molecules there are in a mold, don't we? That's Avogadro's number. We know that. So what we have to do is figure out how many moles of sucrose we have. If we know how many moles of sucrose we have, all we have to do is multiply that by Avogadro's number. And that gives us molecules. We're going to do this once again. We have a concentration and a volume. Remember, concentration times volume is moles. All right, here's our math. Here's our concentration. Ooh, that's supposed to be two there, isn't it? I hope I did this right, but here's our volume. I got the wrong number in there, sorry. Liter and per liter cancel. Yeah, so this this is the wrong. This, Maybe in the problem changes to 1.25. So, so you can play along. Sorry for that. So this would be 0.375 moles of sucrose. Now, we know that every mole is going to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That's Avogadro's number. Every mole has that many molecules. The way this looks, mole and per mole will cancel. And we're only left with molecules. 0.375 times 6, we have 2.26 times 10 to the 23rd. Now that's a nice trick you could do, right? Simply convert moles 
the molecules using Avogadro's number. Let's look at another one here. Remember when we did moles, we also did mole ratio. <clears throat> so here we're going to do a simple problem, just like the other. Back to you. Can you go back? Um, just of course I can. Thank you. Got to learn to write faster, though. <laughs> okay. I try my best to talk slowly. You have to try your best to write fast. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Thank you. So we were talking about mole ratios, formulas and mole ratios. So we're going to use this to talk about ions in a given solution. We have 2.5 molar sodium sulfate. How many moles of sulfate are there? How many moles of sodium? in 150 mils. Well, what do we have in this problem? We are given concentration and volume, aren't we? Concentration times volume is moles. So right away we can tell how many moles of sodium sulfate we have. Then we'll just look at the mole ratio to see how many ions we have of each type. Concentration, 2.5 moles per liter. Volume in liters, 0.15 liters. Liters and per liter cancel, we're only left with moles. So we have 0.38 moles of sodium sulfate in our sample. Now, let's look at the mole ratio for sodium and for sulfate. Remember mole ratio. In every mole of sodium sulfate, how many sulfates do you have? One. So our mole ratio here is one to 1. We're going to multiply this by our number of moles. Moles of sodium sulfate cancel. We're only left with moles of sulfate. So this is 1 times 0.38. I can do that in my head. It's 0.38. Every sodium sulfate that dissolves releases one sulfate. Now, sodium is just as simple. We have two moles of sodium for every sodium sulfate, don't we? So, two ions. So, we're going to take our 0.38, multiply it by 2, and we have 0.76. sodium sulfate dissolves, it will form two sodium ions in solution and one sulfate. The ions totally dissociate from each other. Two sodiums and one sulfate. All right, this problem is very similar, just slightly different math. Look at it and <coughs> Let's figure out how to do this. This is barium chlorate. We have a mass, we have a molar mass, and we have a volume. Go ahead and set up for the molarity of this solution.
just like we did at the very beginning here. We have a mass and a molar mass. That's going to give us moles. To get molarity, we just need to take moles and divide it by meters. Divide this by 1,000, that's 0.468 liters. 248 divided by 304 divided by 0.468. Grams cancel, per mole comes up top. And we're left with 1.74 moles per liter. All right, now, what if I ask you, in this solution, at 1.74 molar, in this solution, in one liter, how many moles of barium do we have? And how many moles of chlorate? Remember to get your mole ratios. You just go to your formula. In barium chlorate, one barium chlorate, how many moles of barium are there? One. And how many moles of chlorate? Two. Therefore, one mole of barium per mole of barium chlorate, two moles of chlorate per mole of barium chlorate, Therefore, how many moles of barium? 1.74. How many moles of chlorate? Or well, twice as many. Again, when things dissolve, when barium chlorate dissolves, it forms three ions in solution, one barium and two chlorates. Now let's go back and do this again with a practical lab question. Let's say that we had a solution of 1.74 mole barium chlorate, and I need 0.01 moles of it. How do we do this? <clears throat> Simply remember your basic equation. Polarity is going to be moles divided by liters, right? We know how many moles, we know our molarity. We simply need to solve for liters. We're going to divide moles by mole per liter. Here's our number of moles that we want. Here's our concentration in moles per liter. Moles cancel, liters comes up top. Do our simple calculation. We get 0.057 liters or 57 milliliters. questions. All right. This uh, one is titled Molarity 2. <coughs> um, some of the questions in Molarity 2 <coughs> are going to seem really obscure. If they do, Hit the magic new problem button until you find one that you like. That's what I do too. <laughs> this is one that we would like. We're looking for a volume of 0.05 molar methanol. And again, we want um, 0.037 moles of our solute. 
So what we're doing here is simply solving for moles. <clears throat> we have a concentration here, we have its molar mass, and we want 0.037 moles. We're looking for volume. Same basic relationship. Concentration is moles divided by volume, so we solve for volume. <clears throat> moles divided by moles per liter will give us liters. All I do is I plug it in here. I get 0.666 liters. <clears throat> um, we want the volume in milliliters. Therefore, we will take our 0.666 and multiply it by 1,000. Remember, don't enter milliliters or anything like that, just numbers, and you get it right. Let's do another one of these. Here we're looking for mass. How many milligrams, actually? So we would do grams first, then convert it. We have a volume, and we have a molarity. Okay. So we're looking for a mass. If we have concentration and volume, what do we have? Moles. Right? Concentration times volume gives us moles. So we can do that until how many moles of methanol we have. Now, we know that one mole of methanol weighs 32 grams. So if we know how many moles, we just multiply that by 32, and that gives us our grams. Finally, just to be annoying, we have to convert that to milligrams, so we multiply by 1,000. All right, here's what it looks like. Concentration times volume gives us moles. Here's our concentration, here's our volume. We have 0.872 moles. Now, we know that every mole weighs 32 grams. So we're going to multiply our number of moles by our molar mass here, and that's going to give us grams of methanol. And then finally, the annoying part. 27 grams is how many milligrams? It's just times a thousand, isn't it? And here's one more <clears throat> that I thought was acceptable. Can you come back? I'm sorry. Oh, go back? Okay. I know I can't bypass it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Again, with a little mini print, you not only learn to write fast, but you learn to write very small. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Great life lessons here. <laughs> okay. What volume is our concentration if we want so many moles? We're looking for a volume here. <clears throat> well, you can just remember concentration times volume is moles. So moles divided by concentration must be volume. Only problem is it's going to give us the volume in liters, and we want to do milliliters. So again, we have to multiply by 1,000. <clears throat> moles divided by concentration is our volume in liters. If this, if this, we wind up with 0.05 liters.
Now to convert that to mils, we know that every liter is a thousand milliliters. So we're just going to multiply this by a thousand, and we have 50 mils. Any questions? Now again, we're not going to have, you know, on our next exam, we're going to have several chapters. So there's only going to be a few of these molarity problems on there. But here's just an assortment of, from old exams, what some of the molarity questions look like. Here we have 10 grams of sodium hydroxide and 500 mils of solution. What's our molarity? Remember, how do we do this one? We have a mass and a molar mass. That gives us moles, doesn't it? We have a volume. Convert that to liters. And that gives us moles per liter. So, how do we do this? Again, our molarity is going to be a mass, a mole of sodium hydroxide, divided by our liters, right? Moles of sodium hydroxide is just going to be mass divided by molar mass. And our calculation is simple. 10 divided by 40 divided by 0.5. We're at half molar. All the same sort of problem. Moles divided by liters. Here we're looking for grams of calcium nitrate. How many grams do we have to dissolve to make 500 mils of a one molar solution? All right, a one molar solution is going to be one mole per liter, right? But we only have half a liter. Just logically, we only need half a mole, right? You can just do that in your head. But let's do it the long way. <clears throat> Here's our moles per liter. That's our one molar solution. We have half a liter. Simply multiply it together. We have half a mole. Now, how much does one mole weigh? 64. How much does half a mole weigh? Half of 164. 164 divided by 0.5, that's half of it, and it's going to be 82 ish. This is bleach. Bleach is 0.7 molar sodium hypochlorite. All right. How many grams of sodium hypochlorite do we have in a liter? Well, what we need to know is how many moles of sodium hypochlorite we have in a liter. Now, if you think about this, 
This is 0.7 moles per liter, isn't it? So that's simple. So how are we going to work this? Bottom line is going to be 0.7 times 74. So let's do it the long way. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> we have one liter, that's here, 0.7 moles per liter. So we're dealing with 0.7 moles. Now, if one mole weighs 74, 0.7 moles is simply 0.7 times 74. And that's 52 grams. All right. Let's just work maybe one or two of the remaining problems. You can work the others. Um, and if you uh, want to check your answers, I'll be happy to go over them with you on Monday, okay? But here, let's do this one. What volume in liters of a 1.71 molar solution, KCL, what would we do if we wanted 21 grams of KCL? So let's think about our logic here. In order to get grams of KCL, we need to know how many moles of KCl there are, right? We are given a concentration, and we're looking for moles. So we're trying to solve here for liters. We want to convert our mass to moles, and then we're going to solve for volume. Mass divided by molar mass gives us moles of KCl. Twenty-one grams is what we're shooting for. Every mole weighs seventy-four point five five grams. Grams cancel. This gives us the number of moles of KCl. Now we're looking for a volume. We know the concentration, that's moles per liter, and we know the number of moles. In order to get the volume, we simply need to take our moles and divide it by our concentration. Remember, <clears throat> concentration is moles over liters. And all we're doing here is solving for liters. Do our simple math. And this is 0.165 liters. How many mils is that? That would be 16.5. I tell you what, let's just do this one. Here we're taking lead nitrate. Is lead nitrate soluble in water? Of course it is, because all oh, nitrates you. are soluble, aren't they? All right. We have a concentration and a volume. We're going to mix this with 7.4 liters of 2.3 mole lead nitrate. So we have two lead nitrate solutions. They have different concentrations. We're going to take some of this, mix it with some of this. Still going to be lead nitrate, but what's our concentration? What we have to do here is to figure out the number of moles 
of lead nitrate for each solution that we're adding. <clears throat> for our first one here, we have 0.74 liters. No, 0.75 moles per liter, here we go, and 3.2 liters. Again, this is concentration times volume is moles. Liters cancel. So 0.5 molar, 3.2 liters of it. This is 2.4 moles. Well, that's how many moles in the first one. In the second one, we have 2.3 moles per liter. We have 7.4 liters of it. Liters cancel. This is equal to 17 moles. So how many moles of lead nitrate did we put in there total? It's going to be 17 plus 2.4. 19.4 moles. That's how many moles we have. What's our volume? Simply the sum of the two volumes, right? Here we took 3.2 and 7.4. That's our total volume. So we know the number of moles by adding these together. Know the number of liters by adding those together. Therefore, it's 19.4 moles, 10.6 liters. What's our concentration? 1.8 moles per liter. Now, that's a nice one to move into our next topic because we're mixing known volumes of solutions together, right? Our next topic in this chapter, the last topic, is solutions. If we have a solution of some known concentration, and we take and we dilute it, what's our final concentration? Uh, this little scheme here is actually uh, from homeopathic medicine. And we're going to do this problem in a little bit when we talk about serial dilutions. But okay, the thing to remember about dilution is that the number of moles does not change. We are putting in a fixed number of moles. And all we're doing is changing our volume. We can use concentration times volume to get the number of moles. And then we simply need to adjust that for our new volume. They're actually very simple problems. Just remember, the solution is diluted. Concentration changes, the volume changes, but the number of moles does not. Important thing to remember. Let's look at a problem. Oh, <clears throat> that's right. Um, I wanted to put this here because this is the um, method we're going to use to calculate this. This is volume times concentration. We know that that equals moles, right? When we say one, this is our initial state before we dilute it. We're going to go and now change it, change our volume, change our concentration. But because the number of moles doesn't change, our initial V1, C1 must equal the final. V2, C2. Number of moles, both of these are moles. Number
for moles does not change. All right, let's do this in the problem. We have sodium chloride. We have 0.53 moles per liter. We take 500 mils of this. We're going to dilute it until we have 1750 mils. What's our final concentration? Again, this is kind of a real lab sort of thing because you'll have a stock solution that's concentrated and your working solution will be diluted. And so you want to take your stock solution, water it down to get the concentration you want. <clears throat> number one, the number of moles does not change. Okay? Number of moles does not change. Here we know <clears throat> we can calculate moles by concentration and volume. Here we have a concentration. Here we have a volume. So that's going to give us the number of moles. Once we know how many moles, our final volume is going to be 1.7 liters, isn't it? Therefore, we can do this. B1, C1, B2, C2. We are looking for our final concentration, that's C2. Solve this for C2. Here I plug in all of our knowns. Concentration times volume. This is our unknown concentration. This is our final volume, C2, or V2. Simply solve for C2. And it's going to be half a liter times 0.53 moles per liter divided by 1.75. Our final concentration is 0.15 molar. Simply Dr. took our number of moles. Dr. Young. Yeah. I can't see. So, simply take our number of moles. That's <laughs> concentration times volume. That's our moles, right? Mm -hmm. And divide it by our number of liters. That's all you have to do. One volume of a 2.1 molar solution. Do we need to make 1,600 mils of a 1.1 molar solution? Well, again, we're going to solve for volume in our relationship, aren't we? We're going to simply set up C1, V1, C2, V2, and solve for the initial volume. We are given concentration. We are given concentration and a volume. This gives us our moles. Missing that volume, and we have a concentration. C1V1, C2V2. In this problem, we're looking for a volume here. We have a concentration and volume that gives us moles, and we have a concentration which is missing volume. So our initial volume, V1, is simply going to be 1.1 molar times 1.6 liters. Again, concentration times volume, this is just moles, isn't it? And here we're going to divide this by our molarity, our final molarity, 2.1. That's, um, that's C1. It's simply, so it's 1.1 times 1.6 divided by 
one. This is 0.84 meters. All right, these are standard simple dilutions. Something that's a little more challenging, conceptually perhaps, is a serial dilution. So this is what we saw in the opening slide. <clears throat> and like I said, this is um, standard homeopathic medicine. What do you do in a serial dilution? Is you start off with some solution. Here I'm saying that solution is 0.53 molar. I'm going to take 10 mils of that, and I'm going to transfer it to 990 mils of pure water. So I have one liter again, don't I? But I've diluted from 0.53 down to something else. Now I take 10 mils of this solution, add it to 990 mils of water, and I get a solution that's even more dilute, one liter of it. I take 10 mils of it, do it again, and do it again. And finally, we're left with a very, very dilute solution. Let's follow this through with these four steps and see if we can figure out our concentration. We're going to do this very simply by doing concentration times volume for each step. They're all one liter, so that's simple. We don't need to divide by volume. It's all one liter. We're just going to look at the number of moles in that liter. So initially, we have 10 mils, that's 0.01 liters, and we have a concentration of 0.53. How many moles is this? Concentration times volume, 5 times 10 to the minus 3 now. We have this in 1 liter. Remember, we added 10 mils at 990, so this is 1 liter. So our concentration here now is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. That's our concentration. Remember that one. Now we're going to take 10 mils of it. So again, 0.01 liter. This is our new concentration. So it will be 5 times 10 to the minus 3. Again, liters will cancel. And how many moles did we just transfer? into the minus 5 moles. So, in solution 2 here, we have 5.3 times 10 to the minus 5 per liter, or that's our new molarity. Now we can do this again. This will be our new concentration. Plug it in here. Again, 10 mils, 0.01 liters. Liters cancel. And we're at 10 to the minus 7 moles. Total volume of 1 liter here. So this is 10 to the minus 7 molar. And our final one is going to be just like the others. We're going to substitute 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. Readers cancel. We now have 10 to the minus 9 moles in our solution. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, why do you do this? Because if you ever wanted to have a solution with 10 to the minus 9 moles per liter, you could never weigh out such a small amount of something, could you? You could never weigh it out. 
Therefore, you start off with one you can work with and just do serial solutions. Now, what I think is fun is let's look at this solution and ask the question, <clears throat> how many sodium ions are there in one liter of this solution? How do we do that? Well, because we know Avogadro's number, right? So we know how many moles, and we know how many ions per mole. So it's simple. Just multiply this times <coughs> Avogadro's number, sodium ions per mole. Moles will cancel. And this would be, well, we're still at 10 to the 15 sodium ions, even though we've diluted the heck out of this. But you know what's even more amazing? What's even more amazing? What if we did this thing? We did uh, four dilutions, right? What if I did seven more? No. Seven more? <laughs> yep, I'm just going to take 10 mils and do it again, and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. If I did this seven more times, how many sodium ions would we have in our liter? Thirty-two sodium ions per liter. <laughs> That's not that amazing. Now, when you go to the drugstore and you buy a medicine that's called homeopathic, typically they do ten dilutions. So, whatever drug you're starting with up here at half molar, you're down to thirty-two copies of that in a liter, and they sell you this little tiny bottle <laughs> that, if you're lucky, has one in there. Yeah. And how much do you pay for that? Mm -hmm. yeah, think about that. All right, well, there's a dilution tutorial. So let's work a couple <laughs> dilution problems, and then we're basically done here. Mm -hmm. All right, here, the what final volume. So C1, V1, C2, V2, we're looking for V2. We have 140 mils in that concentration. And here's our final concentration, C2, of 0.56. V1, C1, V2, C2. All we're doing is solving for V2. V2 is going to be our concentration times our volume. That's moles, isn't it? Divided by our second concentration. If you run this through, it gets 0.58 liters. For some reason, we ask for milliliters here, so multiply this by 1,000, and we're at 580 mils. B1, C1, B2, C2. We have 440 mils of 0.05 molar, and we're diluting it to 0.88 liters. My gosh, you could do this when standing still, right? Because we have concentration and volume, that's moles. And we have our volume, that's liters. Moles divided by liters is molarity. We can do this stuff, can't we? <clears throat> Let's convert this to liters, that's simple. Concentration times volume is moles, divided by our second concentration, I'm uh, sorry, our second volume, that gives us molarity. Do our simple math, 0.026 molar.
And I'm sad to say, but the last one for today. Yay. How many liters of solvent do we add to 640 to get 2.8 moles molar solution if we want 0.9 molar? Again, B1C1, B2C2, right? We are looking for B1. We have B2 here, C2, and we have C1. Our volume is going to be our concentration times volume, that's moles, divided by moles per liter, and that's 2 liters. Let's see. Yeah, they just want liters, don't they? Oh, convert the initial volume into liters. I forgot to do that. Okay, here we go. We are shooting for a total of two liters. We are adding 0.64. Therefore, what we really need is only 1.4 liters. This one's a little more complicated. Right. All right, we've added three more tutorials in this chapter. Molarity 1, 2, and solutions. Remember, molarity 2 can be a little obscure. You can shop for questions that you like. <laughs> Could we do the same thing again? <laughs> and we will have lab on Monday. Okay. Are you sure? And yes, I am sure this time. Because, um, you know, I came to school and... I, I am sorry. They, uh, <laughs> they, they stick this makeup in the middle. Because some of the ones in classes just have trouble keeping up. We don't. <laughs> and so, you know, what can I say? All right.